we're worshiping with you tonight. Glad to see everybody back. Uh, I wanted to mention there was something interesting in the news today, if you heard. Um, the basketball star Kobe Bryant passed away at age 41, and I was very surprised to hear that. <laughs> uh, he was someone I watched, I guess, growing up. I used to watch the Pistons play, and, you know, so I guess the lesson for us, I mean, it's a very, very sad, but just always remember this life is like a vapor. It can go away like that. So it's a very sad, sad time, and actually his 13-year-old daughter passed away with him. It was a helicopter accident, uh, and there are three other daughters that are still alive and a mother, uh, like maybe two other daughters, I forget, but there's family still alive, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, that's a very sad thing. So tonight, um, oh, we're going to mouse go, baby, it's okay. Not my fault. You said not my fault. It's part of this morning. It's Betty's fault. She took it. She put it in there. Uh, uh, tonight, we're going to talk about... Psalm 25, verse 7, where the title comes from. Remember not the sins of my youth. This was a statement that David made in the Old Testament. He prayed to the Lord, uh, asking him to forgive the sins that he committed when he was young. You know, we're not necessarily sure how old David was when he made this statement, but the indication seems to be that David is looking back on some of the sins uh, that he committed years before, it sounds like, and he's realizing the foolishness of some of the things he did in his past. I'm sure uh, many of us in here tonight can think back on some of the sins we committed in our youth and that we're not very proud of. For some of us, our youth was only a short time ago. For others, uh, it's been a little longer. But, you know, some of the older folks would probably say, Travis, you're still in your youth. What are you talking about? Well, you know, as we all look back at the foolish things that we've done in the past, particularly our, our youth, what would be considered, hopefully we can look at ourselves as we've grown older, no matter how long ago your youth was, and see much more spiritual maturity and wisdom in comparison to your youth. Hopefully we've grown. Now, this was the progression that David took in the Old Testament, even though David seems to us to have you know, been a very well-rounded, God-fearing young man in his youth, I think he was, he still looked back and saw things that he regretted because he was young, because he did silly things. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we all have sins that we can look back on in regret, committed against our God. That's sort of what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, I have four points to cover as we continue this discussion. And number one, I want to begin by just pointing out first off how much sin and temptation are often associated with youth in Scripture. You see it kind of a lot, actually. As is the title of our lesson, David prayed that God would forgive the sins of his youth in particular. He noted what happened back then, Psalm 25, verse 7. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 22, verse, or 2 in verse 22, Paul says to Timothy, he says, Flee also youthful love, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, uh, with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Job chapter 13 and verse 26 says, For you write bitter things against me, and make me inherit the iniquities of my youth. So here again we see this. Iniquity, heavily associated with Job's youth. Job chapter 20 and verse 11. See it again. It says his bones are full of the sin of his youth. What is it about the youth? Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. It says, Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil when? From his youth. So you see this connection between being young and committing sin, and being be, between being a youth and giving in to evil. So let's look at that a little bit more tonight. I want you to start contemplating just why exactly is that? Uh, why is being a youth often associated with sin, and falling into sin, stumbling into sin? If you go through a list of some of the faithful characters of the Bible, you look at their past, you can look and see some of the sins during their, the earlier portions of these faithful 
individuals' lives. And as they grow older, they become more spiritually mature. And we can really look up to these individuals. But we do see mistakes in their younger days. I think a great example of this is Jacob in the Old Testament. When he was young, you can read about him and that whole ordeal with his father. He was deceitful toward his father Isaac and uh, lying in order to receive the blessing over Esau. Genesis chapter 27, verse 19, we read that Jacob said to his father Isaac, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. Right? Jacob told a lie. He said, I am Esau, your son. We read about how Jacob dressed in Esau's clothes to deceive his father. His father was nearly blind at the time, so he was able to deceive him, putting uh, goat hair on his hands and the back of his neck because his brother Esau was a hairy man. And uh, he even smelled like Esau because he wore his clothes, right, as the text says. It's interesting to see Jacob taking part in some of this in his younger days, in his deception, in his youth. Because later in the book of Genesis, we get to read about him turning into an old man. We read about him growing. who is an old man who was revered and respected. We look back on him. You know, Father Jacob, they, they look back on him as a faithful and a God-fearing man. And I think he was. And, you know, isn't it also a little bit ironic that when you read of Jacob's old age, as he got older, that he was deceived by his sons as he had deceived his father. I think that's interesting. I suppose that we could actually put Jacob's sons on this very list that we're talking about, of those who committed wickedness in their youth. Right? Jacob's sons. They, they sold their brother into slavery. And they told their father that a wild beast had killed him, showed him the coat, and dipped it in the, the blood. 22 years later, you read, about their great guilt that they had, what they had done with their brother Joseph all those many years ago. They still felt it. They still remembered back what they did 22 years before, and then they uh, you know, were able to see Joseph again. How about Moses? I think Moses is a good example. During the first portion of his life, I wouldn't necessarily call him a youth, but the first third of his life, he was about 40, Mo Moses murdered an, an Egyptian. And he had to flee for the next 40 years. After that, he comes back, and he's the leader of all the house of Israel. In the New Testament, uh, we could certainly put Peter on that list, making mistakes. Uh, for the last two-thirds of the whole New Testament, Peter is known uh, as one of the strongest leaders of the church, a uh, pillar. He's the lead voice among the apostles. He, he preached the first gospel sermon. Day of Pentecost, he preached to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, and you know we see that the last 30 years of his life. But if you go back and look at the gospel accounts, you can read about a very young man when Peter was an eager apostle, stumbling into sin very heavily in his youth. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he denied Jesus three times, the rooster crowed, that whole thing. The apostle Paul. Another example of someone who regretted what he did when he was younger. Persecutor of Christians, committing them to prison, uh, you know, aiding in their death. For the closing 30 years of Paul's life, uh, he often looked back on his former sins and was so remorseful for what he had done when he was younger. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9, he said, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. All right, so all that this list of, you could probably find a lot more than this, but these men, most of which grew into men of great faith and, and revered, can look back on their youth with, with such regret and remorse for the sins committed when they were younger. You see that a lot. I think you probably have seen that in your own life. <laughs> Number two on our outline. Before we start diving into the question of why youth is connected with evil, just briefly I want to discuss this. How does scripture define youth? I think that's a good question. Now one of the reasons I wanted to discuss this point is because Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21 that we read a little bit ago says, The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. 
Now you know where I'm going with this. Some people will take this verse and, and use it to promote that doctrine of original sin. They say, you know, it's the false doctrine that says you know, human beings are born into this world, they're sinful at birth, defiled creatures. Well, I want you to just notice that this passage does not say that man's heart is evil from his birth. The verse says he is evil from his youth. Okay? If you study that term in Scripture, you'll learn that the term youth is simply a reference to a young person or an adolescent most of the time. It can refer to someone all the way up near the age of 20 in the Bible. And that's really what you see in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 33. David is referred to as a youth when he goes out to fight Goliath. Uh, the verse says, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. You are a youth. Uh, and and he, is a, he was a man of war from his youth, right? So he's saying, You're just an adolescent. You're just a young man, and Goliath has been training as a man of war since he was a young man. Verse 42 says, And when the Philistine, that's Goliath, looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, a ruddy and good-looking. Ruddy and good-looking. Now, how old do you picture David here? It doesn't tell exactly how old he is, but he's referred to as youth. Do you think he was 10? 10 years old? 12? Although he is referred to as a youth, consider that David is still old enough to tend his father's sheep by himself. That was the job he gave, was given. He was old enough to fight off a lion and a bear protecting his father's sheep, 1 Samuel 17, 34. And he was old enough to bring food to his brothers who were at war by himself. His father sent him away. Now, do you think that his father would have trusted him to do that if he was only 10, 12 years old? No. These evidences would certainly uh, mean David was not younger than 10, 12, but most guess that he was at least 14, perhaps probably closer to 19 or 20. Okay, And yet he's referred to as a youth. You see that throughout the Old Testament. If you look throughout the Old Testament, the age of 20 was sort of uh, an age barrier of adulthood uh, for the Jews. Someone was considered a youth all the way up to their 20s. Uh, 20 was the age at which young men were allowed to go to war. Numbers chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, God said to Israel, Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel, every male individual from 20 years old and above, all who were able to go to war in Israel. The Old Testament uh, references the age of 20, and I just put a bunch of them up here, uh, several times, <coughs> indicating the barrier of, between the youth and being an adult. So I thought that that age was interesting. So, you know, if we go back to the story of David, one thing that we understand is that he was not old <coughs> enough to go to war with his brothers yet, thus he was younger than 20, but he was certainly at least 12, 14. Okay. Also remember, you know, I just threw this one in, in at the last minute, but, um, remember the generation of Israelites who came out of Egypt. The adults were told that they would not inherit the promised land, but it would be given to their children. And do you remember the age? All those who were 20 and under, they would get to enter in. So, if you want a biblical age for this terminology of youth, I think that that's a really good, you know, somewhere in there. Here's a timeline. Everyone under 20, youth. Everyone over 20, adulthood. And that's sort of what you see in Scripture, maybe give or take a few years, you could move it that way or this way a little bit. Youth is most referred to as adolescent, a juvenile, a teenager, someone who is young. Proverbs uh, chapter 5, verse 18 says this, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. All right, you don't get married when you're under 10 years old, obviously. <laughs> Biblically, men and women were married in their youth or around that time, somewhere in that time frame. On one website said this. Oh, I'm sorry, I put that. There's the verse, Proverbs 5.18. One website said, uh, The time between puberty and age 20 has been considered the ideal time for men and women to wed in traditional Jewish thought. Some rabbis have gone further to recommend the age of 18 or 21 most ideal. Uh, a lot of others have advocated for the time immediately following pu puberty, closer to the age of 14 essentially as early in life as possible. Another website said this, marriage took place at a 
young age for the ancient Jews. Most rabbis proposed 18 as the most appropriate age for men to be married. But it was, was not uncommon for them to be younger, especially in times of peace. Young women were married almost as soon as they were physically ready. So I think that's kind of telling of the history. So it's interesting. Uh, you know, rejoice in the wife of your youth. So consider again what the Bible says when it says, the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. What are we talking about here? Does that mean that little babies are born wicked, as some people try to teach? Not at all. What this passage is saying is that at some point in a person's youth, his thoughts get set on wickedness, and he separates himself from the God of heaven in his youth, and sometime right around there. So this does not mean we have an evil heart at birth, and when we're six, when we're seven, when we're eight, right? The Bible doesn't teach that concept at all. So you know, if you want to put some sort of an age on it, roughly sometime between 12 and 20, man begins to seek evil, the Bible says. Consider how uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29, comes into play here. Truly, this only I have found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. I think that's a great passage. This passage says, God made man what? Upright. Not a sinner, right? Not depraved, not wicked, but upright. That word means straight, correct, right level, pleasing, just, fitting, proper, and righteous, right? God made man righteous. But at some time in our youth, we separated ourselves from the Holy God. Which brings us to point number three of this lesson. Why is sin so often associated with our youth? Why is it? Why do the youth often stumble into sin? Why are young people so susceptible to it? Uh, I have four reasons in this lesson. Number one, in our youth is where we get our first dose of true temptation. When you are four years old, six years old, even eight years old, sometime in there, your brain was not fully capable of understanding sin and true temptation to sin. Because of your innocence, your actions could not separate you from your God. So the Bible teaches. The Bible talks about an age where children do not know the difference between good and evil. We've studied that before. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 15. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that you dread shall be forsaken by both her kings. Right? So the Bible specifically mentions a point in which a child does not know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 39. It's another great passage. Uh, Moreover, your little ones and your children, whom you say will be victims, who today have, listen, no knowledge of good and evil, they shall go in there. To them I will give it, and they shall possess the land. Right? We're talking about the Canaan land. But somewhere in our adolescent years, we acquire a true knowledge of good and evil for the first time. Somewhere in those years. And once our mental capabilities reach that point, Satan is ready to send us our first true temptations to separate us from God. The point is, we've never faced the tempter before. Not really. We've never battled against sin. Before now... Before your adolescence, you were quote unquote immune from Satan's grasp. He couldn't really hurt you because of your innocence. But now that we've lost that incapability, we're fair game. And we can separate ourselves from God. So, and, and when we are an adolescent, uh, we've, because we've never battled sin before, sin is so easy to fall into. And that's when it happens a lot of the times. And in this, in the, the, the first few battles, you're going to lose because. Uh, you've never done it before. You've never battled the devil the way an adult has to battle the devil. So Satan wins many battles in our youth. 
think that that's what we see. So why do youth often stumble into sin? Because they're battling true temptation for the first time, and many battles are lost in those adolescent and early adulthood years. You're losing a lot of battles. Number two, our fleshly desires grow stronger in our youth. Fleshly impulses. The desire to fulfill the works of the flesh grows stronger as we move into our teen years and adolescent and 20s, right? As a child, your body was not fully developed. And it was not fully capable of operating to capacity, right? It is, as you reach 11 years old, 12, 13, 14, 15, right? Things really begin to change chemically with your brain, with your body, whether you're a male or a female. We all know the changes that take place during those years. As an adolescent, the true battle begins between your spirit and your flesh, and it starts to take off. Right? Much more than when you were just a child. There's a difference. And you are inexperienced. That's the point. Very inexperienced. These new temptations are hard to fight against, and you fail. Number three. I think this is a big one. We have a sense of invincibility in our youth. Right? Finally, feeling a sense of independence and growth you know, that you didn't have when you were younger. You have a knowledge of good and evil, and it's, it's, it's the time of your life where you feel like nothing can hurt me. You start feeling bold, and, and I can do anything I want. And you'll say, I have years left to live. I, I, it won't hurt to experiment and sin. I'll make things right later. You know, that sort of thing, uh, that sort of thinking gets young people trapped in sin for the rest of their life. You get trapped in different things, and you're, oh, God, I'll stop doing that when I'm 25, when I'm 30. It doesn't work that way. A lot of people get caught in sin in their youth, and they regret it for the rest of their life. Number four, why are we so sinful in our youth? Our brains are still developing in that time. If you look at it scientifically, studies show us today that man's brains are not fully developed until... You can extend that a little bit. The age of 25, men's brains still develop. A woman's brain is not fully developed until 21. They, they develop a little quicker than us guys. So there's a period here where we're starting to battle Satan's devices for the first time, but our brains are not operating at 100% yet. So we're still developing. We're still maturing. And so we do silly things. And each of us, and by the way, I think God will take that into account a little bit if, if a teen dies. you know, I'm, I'm sure that it will be fair with the judgment. But each of us, we can remember back to our teen years and when we thought that we were just as smart as the grown-ups. Now looking back, you realize that you did not know what you were talking about. <laughs> Certainly we can all agree that you know, from ages 12 to 15, that was a very big, actually I actually put 12 to 25, was a very big learning period in your life. You're still growing. You're still maturing. So many times that is when some of life's biggest mistakes happen that we'll regret for the rest of our lives. So point number four. What can we learn? How can we wrap all this up that we've talked about tonight? I have a message first for anyone who's parents or anyone who knows parents. We must teach our kids to trust God's word. That's the guy. Okay? Equip them as they grow. Be there for them through these tough years. You know it's going to be hard. You know it's going to be hard on them. If you're an adult, if, you're, if you don't have a kid, but you know a young person, help them. Help them in any way that you can. The Bible says about parents, we read it this morning, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22, and verse 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and verse 4 says, And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Next, We'll draw a conclusion for the youth themselves. The Bible has some great instruction for teens and adolescents and young adults as you mature and grow older. The Bible says, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. How important was that one? Seek the Lord now, the Bible says. Don't try to procrastinate. And say, oh, I'll do it when I'm older. You know, when I'm 50, I'll turn right. I'll see. You might not have until you're 50. 
2 Timothy 2, verse 22, we read, flee also your youthful lust. Get, flee those youthful lusts, but pursue actively righteousness, faith, love, peace. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul says to young Timothy, he says, let no one despise your youth, right? don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but be an example to the believer in word and conduct and love and spirit, faith and purity. Lastly, for the rest of us, let us take this lesson and uh, look at our own progression as a person, as a Christian. You should be much more godly, much more knowledgeable, much more holy than you were in your youth. You should be progressing and growing in God's word. What a sad situation when someone remains in the same foolishness they took part in in their youth. It's a sad thing. So our lesson tonight, remember not the sins of my youth. Some people like to say, time heals all wounds. Right? God will forget about it. But when it comes to sin, that's not how it works. Right? You have got to have your sins washed off by the blood of Christ. You can't just say, that was a long time ago. That's taken care of. Not this. No, it's not taken care of. If you didn't take care of it with the blood of Christ, it's still on your record. So if you've not been washed by the blood of Christ, here's the bad news. God still remembers the sin of your youth. All those things that happened long ago. So if you would like your sins remitted and blotted out, the Bible says obey the gospel. Make sure. Get rid of it. Get, off, get it off your soul. By hearing that word, believing it, repenting, confessing and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And the Old Testament talked about a time when your, their sins and their lawless deeds I would remember no more. Once you contact the blood of Christ, those sins are gone. I'll never remember those sins again. So if you would like to do that tonight, the water's ready. Anybody else can come while we stand and as we sing. Hear my cry, Lord.